Welcome to Season 4 of the Religion Podcast, where a rabbi and a reverend walk into a podcast and talk real about religion. Shalom. <laughs> Howdy, Rabbi Eric. How are you, buddy? I'm good, Joel. How are you? I'm good. Our Easter's over, but your Passover is not. Not quite. It is so close. So close. <laughs> so, of course, everything is complicated. Some Jews end it tonight. Others end it tomorrow. It all has to do with if you're not in Israel. Uh, so for Jews living in the diaspora, some end it eight, after eight days, some after... And most Reformed Jews end it after seven, myself included. So tonight... I will be eating lots of bread, most likely with cheese and red sauce, uh-huh. namely pizza. Yummy. But it has been – yeah, well, tell me about Easter. How, well, Easter's Easter not really over you? either. Uh, the first Sunday of Easter is the first of many Sundays, and it stretches all the way to Pentecost, which is at the end of May, early June-ish. So uh, we're we're really not out of Easter yet. We're going to be extending it for the normal time all the way through until Ascension, Pentecost, and Trinity Sunday, uh, which are odd little Sundays that most Christians don't even know about unless you're clergy. <laughs> yes. And in, interestingly, in well, Passover is over tonight or tomorrow night, but we also begin this period, or we began this period on the second night of Passover called the Counting of the Omer, which I do not want to take up our whole show talking about, but it's the 49-day period between Passover, which celebrates our freedom on the one hand, and Shavuot on the other, which is the celebration of our receiving Torah. And in some ways, Shavuot is the counterpoint to Passover as the Torah represents mitzvot, which are commandments. So in some ways, it's the counterpoint of freedom in that on Shavuot, we take responsibility. We take the commandment for ourselves. And so there's lots to play with there and and uh, it's a really interesting and, and, and special time. Um, but that is not our topic today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's interesting because there are seven Sundays of Easter, which means seven weeks, which would be 49. Um, and that's, uh, you know, another odd little crossover connection there, huh? Oh, Correct. Odd. And speaking of connections, I actually thought this was false. And then I, what I'm about to say, and then I looked it up on chat GPT and it is true. I thought it was just one of those memes people were sharing on Facebook. And I was like, is this true? Namely that Passover, Easter and Ramadan coincide every 30 years. Nice. I thought it, I would have thought it was more than that. Um, more often than that, rather. Um, and this year is one of them. And, you know, Passover, I think I spoke about this last time, but, you know, the message of Passover is not just one of remembrance in that we remember our freedom, which we certainly do. Um, but something that is hugely important to me and I think my community is what do we do to bring freedom to others and to bring more freedom to ourselves and our community? Because, And, of course, freedom means lots of different things in different contexts. Um and the combination of those disparate faiths tradition, I think, speaks to that message of religious pluralism and understanding and love and, you know, values that you and I certainly hold dear together. There you go. Preach it, my brother. Today... I think we are starting back way at the beginning, if you're okay with that. You mean the baseball game? <laughs> no. For, for, do you get the joke? No. Do you know that no, joke? No, I'm waiting. Where, where, it, and you can cut this if you want, but I think it's good. Where in the, when I use it as where in the Torah, you could say where in the Bible is there a baseball game? In the big inning. Oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> I'm here all week, folks. Oh, that's painful, dude. <laughs> here all week. Yeah, I, I, I've i heard it, but then I intentionally forgot it, and now you've put it back into me. Sure. And I'll have to get that odd little item that an zaps angel me dies with light time... and erases my memories. Yeah, an angel dies every time I say that joke. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, on to our theme. Talk to us. Right. The the controversial word slash phrases is image of God. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? And if so, if humanity is, quote, created in the imago dei image of God, then where does sin come from? Not the origin of it, but we sometimes Christianity has an issue with this weird doctrine we call original sin. And I want to talk that over with the rabbi and even what it means to be uh, birthed into a garden and then later locked out of the garden because of our, what, our sin, our original sin, our choice of sin. Uh, do we ever get back to the garden? And so we use those terms, the almost all religions use some kind of uh, theology about creation, about sin, and about garden or the the original place of us. And I just, I want to walk through what that means for you and for me and see where we resonate, see where we're struggling, uh, both of us are struggling, or see even if we might disagree on any of it. How about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, for me, I think they're going to be much more separated than they are for you. And, and that's just a guess. Um, but so I'll take the image of God. And then if you want to, if you want to bounce off that, and then uh, we'll go from there. So for me, and I think for Judaism, uh, in the image of God is, it's not a physical image. It's not like, um, you know, you and I have children and our children somewhat look like us. And it's, oh, they're in your image. Like, you know, it's not a gene thing. It's not a hereditary. It is a value. It is a spirituality. So we are in the image of God in the sense that we are creators. We have a measure of power as demonstrated just a few chapters later when God shows Adam all of the animals and God has Adam name them and naming them confers a kind of power and responsibility. And God does say, you know, the earth is yours to, to take care of, um, which is also kind of a source of uh, environmental care and concern that, that we point to all the time. Um, but for me, and again, I think for, if not Judaism generally, certainly reform Judaism specifically holds being created in the image of God as a central value. And we use it with regard to things like sexism, homophobia, gender and sexual affirming, uh, sexual identity affirming care in the sense of one should not be considered less than or have laws applied to them that make them feel outed or hurt or unfairly treated because they are, you know, insert what identity here, right? And so everyone being in, created in the image of God, meaning then means that every person has holiness and every person's identity is and can be one of holiness. And so to silence that identity or to, um, to try and make it not exist is not only ethically wrong, it's religiously wrong. And so it, it really is a, an absolute central value. That's the image of God in a nutshell. Gosh, I'm with you. I, I, I'm waiting to hear someplace yeah, of course you are. on all of that. I'm waiting to hear someplace where I'm like, nah, I don't know. We kind of... Um, and I don't even think that not just me, but I think Christianity is uh, with you in a lot of that. I, I do think that there are some edgy Christians where the image of God does take on a little bit more physicality, that we tend to look more like God than any of the other creatures or animals. Um, but I'm I'm not sure that that's necessary for my strain of Christianity. And even if it is true, it would only be true in the the second person of the triune God who chose to come among us as one of us. But that doesn't That's necessarily right. mean that God looks like that in, in whatever the others of God are. But uh, so I don't, I don't even need that, the physicality uh, aspect. It's more like God created God's self in our image than God created us in God's once we have an image, uh, a created image. So I'm, I'm okay with, 
geez, everything that you did there. But for me, like, so what is it about being imaged of God where, um, where something worthy of being ejected from the garden happens for, for you? What is there something about God's imagery so of, I, in us or of yeah, us? Yeah, I, I personally, in my own theology, do not link the two of those. The expulsion, I mean, the expulsion from the garden is tricky, regardless of religious tradition, right? But I would not say that that is a uh, call. There's no causal relationship between that and God creating us in God's image. That's fair. They're in two different creation stories anyway. So uh, they're, right. they don't have to be connected. But we typically, because the the Torah is one thing and we think of it as pointing to a one God, we, if we go, okay, so we're created in God's image. And okay, we screwed up in the garden. Um, I wonder what it is about Godness that we carry that gives us room to screw that up. Well, you know, if I really want to go out on kind of a theological limb, I would I would say that, you know, I think I've talked about this before that, you know, there's no uh, dogma in Judaism where one must believe that God is perfect and that God does not make mistakes. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've done this as, as like a, a one hour kind of program before where I where I point out things from the Bible where God in some ways regrets God's decisions, you know, the the, fl- the flood with Noah is, is a prime, if not the prime example where God says, oh, I'm never going to do that again. That was that was not good. And so, um, you know, there's no there's no like rule that God has to be perfect. Right. So God makes mistakes. We make mistakes. God creates. We create. God even learns, perhaps. So um, so. Those things for me are where the image of God is. And also, in some ways, it does set humanity apart. God doesn't create anything else in the image of God. God creates humans in the image of God. And and for me, that bestows a kind of responsibility, a sense of holiness um, that I it, my that my best self always takes seriously. Well, so for, for me, there's this weird doctrine in Christianity, and I think we've put way too much time on it called original sin. And it means that whatever in that second creation story where Adam and Eve, who it doesn't say it in the second creation story, it says it at the end of the first, but they were created in God's image. God still wasn't happy with all of creation in some ways. And so creates Adam and, and it keeps on making animals and animals. And Adam is not happy with all the other stuff that God has created. And so finally makes Eve in Adam's image, in a way, is is how the second story right, would say out of it. his rib. Um, so that, and by the way, so li- listeners sh- should be clear about this. When when Joel and I talk about two creation stories, this isn't like a sermon or a midrash. This is in the Torah slash Bible. The first few ge- chapters of Genesis literally tell two different stories. One of them is the, is where God creates uh, creates Adam and Eve. And, uh, or I'm sorry, one, one is where God creates Adam and Adam names all the animals to find a partner. None is suitable. And so then God creates Eve out of Adam's rib. And the other is God creates both of them. Um, they're both there. Yeah. We're not making it up. <laughs> and they're both really ancient and, and they are similar to one another in some of the um, attributes of God. And they're really different. Uh, in the order in which things happen, um, and and even the name for God in those two creation stories in the same Bible, it is a different Very name good, yes. for God. Uh, one is the which is something that you know scholars who who are uh, uh, talk about the uh, the documentary hypothesis, namely that different authors wrote the Torah, point to that as you know th- this this chapter or this story is from one author and this is from another, et cetera. Yeah, and it's why I'm I'm really glad that the whoever assembled the Bible didn't just go, well, this is my favorite one. I'm cutting the other one out. They left them both in there, uh, even though I'm sure they kind of leaned towards one or the other, but they kept them both, and I'm, I'm grateful. For us That's in right. that second creation story, there's something about Adam and Eve in the garden who are told not to eat from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
And the, the serpent kind of goes, ah, don't trust God on that. God's just yanking you around. It, it won't, you won't die. It'll be fine. And Eve uh, does and gets Adam to taste it as well. And, and then they realize some stuff. And God comes hunting for them in the garden one day. And they're hiding because they're ashamed, because they're naked. And then God's like, who told you you're naked? And there's this sudden realization that whatever God did in creating humanity in this garden— They've now adopted some sense of right and wrong, good and evil, uh, holy, unholy. And that adopted sense is a uh, what what Christians sometimes call that tasting of the knowledge of good and evil, wanting to know what God alone can know, was the first great sin. And then that sin is now infected all of humanity forever. It, it is flown down to us. Um, and in some of the weirdo Christian angles, that sin is passed <laughs> on through procreation itself. Um, that's It's like a, an inherited genetic attribute or a physical attribute of the sex act that creates new humans. So that's why Christians sometimes get hung up on sex. Uh, we're like afraid we're just passing on more sin. Ah, uh, I, I struggle with all of that. I, I don't think of sinfulness, original sin, as a necessary theology or doctrine. I don't even think it's right. I don't think it's in the scripture. I definitely don't think the sin that I commit is because of a sin that Adam and Eve committed ancient years ago. I I do like the concept that all humanity is prone to these mistakes, and we have yet to find a human who who does things as perfectly as God would, but I'm I struggle with Christians who overblow this whole original sin thing. And I don't know how you handle the origin of evil um, in, in from these texts, if at all. So I, I think those are two different things. And that's a whole conversation in itself. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's the origin of evil or that the origin of evil and the concept of original sin are even related. Ah, I mean, well, Christians do. A lot of Christians do that. Where We have no solution for if God made everything and God is good, then where the hell did sin come from? Oh, Adam and Eve made that decision. There it is. That's the origin of sin and evil in our world. That explains everything. And everything evil and sinful ever since is on their fault. Um, and it's why Christ is sometimes called the new Adam for us. It erases all the mistakes of Adam that the rest of humanity has inherited from Adam slash Eve. We've erased those in the new Adam who did it right and uh, served and believed and walked faithfully. So it's a weird concept, but it's in there for us. And I don't, how would, you, how do you keep them separated then? How do I keep original sin and uh, suffering yeah. separated? Yeah. Well, so well, it's a tricky question to answer because Jews don't really believe That's in, why I'm believe asking in original it. sin. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's yeah. Let me answer the question, Joel. Um, yeah. I mean, it, there's even a question too that I think is open for debate, even amongst you know the traditional Judaism, not you know like this modern liberal idea of maybe that's what God wanted. Like, that's what needed to happen. So, you know, in some ways, now there were some things that happened that were wrong. You know, um, uh, you know, Adam kind of throwing his wife under the bus when God asked and Adam's like, she told me to, you know, or, or and then, you know, there, there's some kind of deception there too, you know, uh, um, and perhaps not trusting God. I mean, there's a lot there to unpack in terms of kind of, you know, morality and, beha and behavior. But um, first of all, that's on them. It's not on us. You know, as a matter of fact, the, the Talmud very clearly states that, and yes, I am cherry picking a quote because I could also find an opposite quote. I, I, want, I grant that. But that each individual is only responsible for their actions, something that I think you know, good therapy <laughs> would agree with, right? Um, 
Now that being said, the Torah does say, you know, a, a, a sin is visited upon the uh, the fourth generation, and 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 you know, for there's this idea God forgives until the thousandth generation. I could be getting that wrong. Um, I'm going to write that down to make sure I have right in our show notes in case I got that wrong now, uh, which is very possible. Um, but it, but even if Adam and Eve committed a grievous sin, that's not conferred down to us. And then going back to Adam and Eve themselves, um, you know, the, the expulsion from the garden started what we know of as humanity. Before the expulsion of garden, they were, in some ways, they weren't, I mean, they were mortal, but they weren't mortal like you and I are mortal or even mortal like, you know, Methuselah, who lived 969 years. Um, because if you look at the punishments that God lists after they eat from the tree, none of them really seem like punishments. You know, you shall have pain in labor. I mean, sure, you know, not, neither of us have birthed a child physically and and our wives would probably, you know, if they could have the same exact process without pain, I'm sure, you know, and, and without drugs or whatever, you, you know what I mean? Um but I don't, yeah, I just don't look at that as like a divine punishment. So that, that's a long-winded way of saying that I don't put, put much stock in the concept of original sin. Like we are lacking something because of what Adam and Eve did. And now I have to spend my life either seeking absolution from that or, you know, trying to to do better so that God forgives me. I try to do better because it's the holy thing to do, not so that God can forgive me. Yay. That's, that's great. I'm glad to know that y'all are in that bucket. And there is this weird strain of Christianity where maybe, I don't know, a fifth to a third of us are in there with you. Uh, and we kind of resist the majority of Christians who talk about sin today as a, still attached to the original sin, that the ad, uh, Christ as the second Adam is the only thing that can clean all that up. Um, and because Christ has already come and gone and been raised for everything, it's already cleaned. So um, what I find is Christians tend to, the ones who believe in original sin, saw it as fixed already, and therefore they don't have to do better. They're, they're fine. They're covered. It's over. Uh, I'm good. Um, now, I don't, I do still think of myself as responsible for the sins of those who came behind me, but only in the sense that my current actions and decisions and words need to be unraveling the downstream consequences of the people behind me. I, I'm not responsible for their choices in the past. I am. Re- right. So that's not, that's not the, I, I would argue that that's not theological. That's kind of a moral imperative. Ah, see, I put that on a theological as well. Um, and I, I do that with how, whatever sin is, right? Sin is not just a decision uh, that I make uh, or don't make uh, in the current present. It's also a condition into which I was born. Um, therefore, my responsibility is to is to clean up the mess that I was born into, not just the mess that I personally create. And got and I, it. And I do that. Yeah, but no, I, maybe I take it back. Maybe I take it back. I, I agree with that. Yeah. I thought you might, and I think we've talked about that before. Yes. But what I don't do is I don't attach the mess I was born into to Adam. And I don't attach that to God's creation of Adam and Eve in the garden and God's allowance or God's plan for evil or sin to enter the world. And therefore, sin is inherited. I It's just the water I swim in. I, I swim in the sins of those who came before me. And I do my best to clean the pool while I swim in it. Um, it it's, it's a weirdo. Yeah. And I mean, there's so much there, mostly because it's, it's, they're the first human beings they're the, and they're the first people mentioned in the Bible. So, and you know, anything we can learn from them, then we kind of blow up in, in terms of a, a, a general 
metaphor for humanity. And it, that's not necessarily the case. You know, they were too, and again, I'm, I'm interpreting it as if it was literal, like they, they were two human beings with their own individual uh, proclivities, at, just like each human being has. Um, and they were, but yeah, I don't, they were see- meant to be symbolic of humanity. I don't take them literally. That is if there was an oh, actual yeah, male. Absolutely. Actual, I, yeah. It's come on. And the other thing, like, you know, we both have children. How many times have we told our children? Yeah, you could, you know, you could play with any of these toys, but not this one, or, you know, this one's daddy's or this one's mommy's or this one might break. And of course they play with it and sometimes break it or sometimes. And it's like, yeah, in a, like, they, what do we say? They're human, right? They're not like, so, and this is God. Like, wouldn't you be curious? Like, I would be curious. And I'm, and I'm not only am I, you know, a 49 year old who's had life experience, but I also have the life experience of the thousands of generations before me, which Adam and Eve did not have. Right. And I think I still would be like, oh, I know God told me not to do this, but you know, the snake says it's okay. I mean, I just think it, to say that that is uh, this horrible sin um, is so anathema to my sense of um, understanding, both theologically and just kind of as a human being. And and it also ties into later on, this is kind of a, a fun thing. I, I, I think I may have mentioned Rashi before. So Rashi was the first person to kind of systematically interpret the Torah, right? And um, and what he does is he, is he asks questions that's that might that if you take the Torah super seriously and you think about it, doesn't make sense. So one of those is, what are you drinking? You're devouring that thing. Still sweet, sweet, sweet tea, tea, baby. Yeah. Nice. Hope not the same glass. I hope. Nope. <laughs> uh, when after the eating of the fruit, God asks Adam, Adam, where are you? Right now, reading the, you know, if you if you read and study the Torah closely, the question kind of doesn't make sense because God knows where Adam is because God's God, right? So the question, what Rashi says is like, what, it's like, again, what, like when one of our kids does something and it's like, what did you do? We know what they did. We saw it. We want to see if they realize it or we want to see how they react. And so God even asking that question in some ways shows that like God kind of knew Adam would do it. And what just, you know, it, it, it's yeah, it, there's a lot of depth there, a lot of room for interpretation. And, and you know, that, that's what I love about the story. What is garden for you then? What was it? What is it now? Is there some future garden? Uh, how does how does that wrap into being yeah. whatever God created and then whatever God created in the image of God? Those two are connected to one another. Um, we've spent all this time on the yeah. pieces and parts that were created in the image of God. What about the rest of it? Yeah, so, you know, Gan Eden in Hebrew uh, is used sometimes as like a catch-all for, you know, like a, a perfect world. Like, And sometimes it, it's talked about in terms of kind of a heaven, like it'll be like Gan Eden. I think of it as a time of innocence. Um, but if I if I were to make a mo- – like what would the modern kind of Garden of Eden, the utopia look like? I think of it uh, – to use another agrarian uh, Jewish term, there's the term pardes – which means an orchard. Orchard? Orchard? Which is it? Orchard. Orchard. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, so in Judaism, pardes is written, uh, well, sorry, in English, the word pardes is written capital P, small a, capital R, capital D, E, capital S, I think, because it's an acronym. The whole, you don't need to remember which letter is which, but the idea is it's an acronym that represents four ways of understanding not just the Torah, but even a word of Torah or a verse of Torah. And what I get from that, from this idea of pardes as an intellectual goal, I would say, is that we are at our best 
when we have a diversity of understanding, when we surround ourselves with a diversity of people, when we're open to hearing from a diversity of our of ideas, like that's the pardes, the orchard of different flowers blooming in different colors and sizes and all these things. That to me is what kind of the, what's the adjective for utopia? Utopic? Utopic? Utopian. Oh, of course. Oh, my goodness. Uh, That, to me, is the utopian Garden of Eden, which is possible. Like, that, for me, is possible. Like, we can work to create that. We we just have to live those values, which is, I don't say that as if it's the easiest thing in the world, but but that's not up to God. That's up to us. And and so it's implied in that, like, there's something about- Sorry, I got it. I got, I got excited and my hand hit the microphone. This topic is, uh, gets to me. (laughs) You're fine. So there's something about what God created that is beautiful and good and orchard-like and paradise-like. I, I, pardes is probably not connected to the our other word paradise, but it might be I now that you say it. You know, I, it's funny. I don't actually think it is, but it's a fun linguistic connection nonetheless. Well, and I, it's making me wonder, like there is this point where Jesus is uh, – there's a story we have where Jesus is on the cross and he's standing – He's hanging between two criminals, and they're kind of arguing uh, with Jesus. One is saying, hey, get us down from here if you're really Lord and Savior. And the other one's going, oh, my gosh, leave him alone. We deserve to be here. He doesn't. Um, and it's weird to have, you know, those – Would you, if you see a Christian church and there are three crosses, like a big middle one and then two smaller ones, uh-huh. that's the story it's referring to. And at the end of that, he kind of turns to the one who defends him and says, today you will be with me in paradise, um, the Greek bear being paradiso. Uh, but it has all those consonants, the P-R-D-S, and uh, the vowels are Greeky vowels. They're, um, and in really the Hebrew, we don't even know what the vowels are were. Um, he was probably speaking Aramaic anyway, So, which is a right. Hebrew, but is a, a Semitic language and it had, had some similar sounds to, to Hebrew. So who knows? Maybe he said, today you'll be with me in paradis. Uh, and everybody thought, oh, he just meant paradise. But what he really meant was the great orchard, the original orchard. Um, I would love to, I'd love to think that. The thing for me about original sin that I don't understand from from a you know from some Christian perspectives is it's like what does that this may be a strange question, but like what's the utility of that belief? Like what does that do for you as a human being? Like what does it motivate one for someone who does subscribe to it, right? Like what 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 is it supposed to make you motivated to do or believe or like, can you speak to that at all? Yeah. So let's take, um, imagine a lot of times Christianity and Christian theologies are crafted to solve obvious problems, obvious logical problems about who God is. That's what theologic sure. is, right? It's it's making some sense out of issues. Well, God is all knowing, God is perfect and God is holy and there's sin in the world. Where did that come from? Ah, it must have come from humanity. Okay, well, why do? Where did we get it? Like, it happens over and over again, which means God's design of us was flawed. No, God's design of us wasn't flawed. We didn't get it from God's bad design. We got it from the first humans who misused God's design, and then they passed it on to us over and over and over and over and over and over again. That is why Christ needed a virgin birth. In the story, if Christ doesn't have a virgin birth, Christ inherits the same sin that we've all gotten. But if you give Christ a beautiful, immaculate conception and virgin birth, then he's fully human, meaning born of a woman, but he's not human like the rest of us, staying with the original sin passed down through um, since the beginning. That never occurred to me. Well, yeah. Yeah, and that little trick in there is why some typically conservative or evangelical Christians are pissed if you take away immaculate conception or virgin birth. If you try to explain to them, look, 
the word virgin in the text doesn't mean that. It, it just means, yeah, it means maiden. It's just child, like a, a, yeah, a, or, yeah. a, an unmarried but already having her period girl. That That's what it means. Right, like a maiden. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a, which in that time was most likely she was a, still a virgin. They would get a better price. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, yuck. Yeah. Uh, that's it, and yes. that's where original sin comes from, and it taints how we see God. Um, okay, God did everything beautiful. We screwed it up. It taints how we see garden. Garden was perfect. We lost access to it because of our sin. Um, that's still, it's pretty simple, and it still works for a lot of Christians. But you have to be way more nuanced in order to play with the other options. Where, where would sin come from? When does garden come back? Is God really allowing sin or even designing sin into the system? By the way, the Jewish answer to that is yes, although I wouldn't use the word sin. I would use the word imperfection, but um, that's, a, that's possibly a different topic. Well, and that is what hamartia, the Greek word for sin, means. It's an imperfect shot. There's only one shot that hits the bullseye. Every other shot is off target. So if you miss the perfection, you've missed. Now, I'm okay with missing the target. I can't hit it. It's... You know, I, I can get lucky and hit it sometimes, but most of the time I'm going to miss. Um, I'm not Ted Lasso on a dartboard. <laughs> <laughs> good good illusion. But I, for the most part, I, I need some room to make mistakes so that grace happens. I'm more interested in the God who is ready with grace than the God who designed mistakes mm. into the system. Nice. Okay, we got original sin out there. We did it. We've got we did it. Imago Dei we did the and thing. something about garden. What does the word Eden mean in Hebrew? It's huh. a good question. I think it means paradise. I mean that it, that would be my guess or perfection. I mean it, that's where we get the idea from. Um, I'm not in my office where I have my. Uh, did you have a Jastro when you were in school? A Jastro, Jastro dictionary. I've got a monster Hebrew lexical dictionary, but I don't remember the word jastro for it. Um, yeah, it was a, well, it's more the top for the Talmud, so you probably wouldn't have one. But that's okay. Um, no, mine was Brown Driver and Diggs or something like that. <laughs> uh, yikes, we just lost Eric. <laughs> his, his internet connection dropped. He's actually still there, but there's, oh, and he's the kid. I, he's talking, but I can't hear him. <laughs> Oh, uh, anyway, thanks for trying, Rabbi Eric, and all to all of our religion fans out there. Keep it real. Thank you for joining us on the Real Religion Podcast today, where a rabbi and a reverend walk into a podcast and talk real about religion. I'm Reverend Joel Talbert, and on behalf of Rabbi Eric Linder and all the Real Religion fans out there, we thank you for being with us today. And invite you to send us any feedback or suggestions or topic ideas to realreligionpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, keep it real. Yes.